ciência é a grande luz da humanidade. E no Brasil, existe uma força científica e integrante da sociedade chamada SBPC, Sociedade Brasileira para o Progresso da Ciência, que há 70 anos atua em defesa da educação, do avanço científico e tecnológico e do desenvolvimento sustentável do país. A SBPC foi fundada em 8 de julho de 1948 em São Paulo por cerca de 60 cientistas reunidos na Associação Paulista de Medicina. Posteriormente, essa data foi estabelecida como o Dia Nacional da Ciência. Nessa época, pós Segunda Guerra Mundial, os institutos e universidades brasileiros enfrentavam uma crise muito séria que motivou esse encontro. Liderado pelo médico e farmacologista Maurício Rocha e Silva, pelo médico José Reis e pelo biólogo Paulo Savaia. Esse movimento tinha a intenção de dar força e representatividade à comunidade científica. Durante a ditadura militar, a entidade foi um grande polo de encontros, trocas de experiências e conhecimentos, se tornando a grande voz da ciência e da educação nacional. E a SBPC entrou no palco dos debates nacionais. Foi um período que consolidou a SBPC como uma chama de esperança dos ideais científicos. Sua estrutura se fortaleceu e a entidade conquistou um papel de liderança nas lutas por melhores políticas públicas, pela democracia e em defesa do desenvolvimento sustentável do país. Uma de suas contribuições mais expressivas foi a criação do Ministério da Ciência e Tecnologia em 1985. Também foi uma das responsáveis pela inclusão de um capítulo dedicado à ciência e tecnologia na Constituição Federal de 1988 e colaborou com os temas ligados aos direitos sociais e meio ambiente e educação. A SBPC é parte da sociedade e seu objetivo é lutar para que a ciência e a educação sejam parte da vida de todos, pois acredita que ciência não é gasto, é investimento. Hoje, a SBPC representa milhares de pesquisadores, estudantes e amigos da ciência e integra mais de 140 sociedades científicas de diversas áreas do conhecimento, muitas delas fundadas no seio da entidade. Seus holofotes estão voltados a cinco pontos principais. Colaborar com o desenvolvimento científico e tecnológico do Brasil, lutar pela qualidade e universalidade da educação, defender os interesses dos cientistas, Promover a disseminação do conhecimento científico por meio de ações e divulgação da ciência. Lutar contra os obstáculos que impedem o progresso da ciência, propondo políticas públicas para o desenvolvimento do país. A SBPC tem uma rica história de contribuição ao desenvolvimento científico e social do país propondo e apoiando leis como o Código Florestal, a Lei da Biodiversidade e o Marco Legal da CTI, angariando recursos para ciências com manifestações do Congresso nas ruas e também promovendo a popularização do conhecimento científico em suas reuniões anuais e regionais por todo o país. Hoje colhemos os frutos de 70 anos de trabalho dessa entidade que acredita no Brasil. Integra a sociedade e convida as novas gerações a cultivarem a curiosidade e o amor ao saber. Os dois grandes motores do progresso humano. SBPC, 70 anos. Ciência e Educação. Ontem, hoje, amanhã. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Luisa Massarani. Uh, I, I coordinate the, the uh, Brazilian Institute for uh, Public Communication of Science and Technology. And uh, I'm very delighted to be here as a moderator of this session called Challenge of Communicating Science to Society. This session is a collaboration between the SBPC and the German Center of Research and Innovation in Sao Paulo. And we have uh, three uh, 
three panelists here, uh, two from Germany. Uh, the first one is Viola uh, van Meers, coordinator of the Center of Research in Communication of the University of Münster. Then we have uh, Paula Irene Villa uh, Braslavsk uh, of the Department of Sociology and Studies of Gender of the University of Munich. Then we have an uh, uh, Italian-Brazilian uh, uh, researcher and science communicator, Yuri Castelfranco, from the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Belo Horizonte. Uh, each uh, panelist will have 15 minutes for uh, the presentation. Uh, then after the three panelists, we have plenty of time for discussion and debate. So please put your questions in the, in the YouTube and we are, we'll be very happy to discuss uh, after the presentation. So uh, please, uh, Viola, uh, Von Mels, uh, the floor is, is yours. Thank you very much and hello to everyone here and in YouTube. Thank you for inviting me and for your um, welcome here. My topic today is research communication for the humanities and social sciences based on 10 years of experience in our Center for Research Communication at Münster University in the west of Germany, since our center is specialized in exactly this. By talking about the communication of our scholars with the public, I hope to give you an idea of our approach to encounter an increasingly populistic climate of debate. The Cluster of Excellence, Religion and Politics, our research, community, our research association, explores many current and past issues related to religion and politics, from antiquity to the past, with focus from antiquity to the present day, of course, with focus on Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Many of our research findings are relevant to emerging challenges in society. That is the ambivalent role, for instance, that religion plays in integration, particularly in our European societies. Religion can both serve as a bridge, but also as a barrier. Therefore, the growing religious diversity is a huge challenge for our society, which needs legal and political regulation. Our scholars therefore focus on questions like these, which factors exactly make religion a motor of social and political change, or are the familiar European models of church-state relations still sufficient? At the same time, the scholars in our cluster believe strongly in making their research findings available to the wider public. The task is to place contentious issues in a broader social, legal, political, ethical, and historical context, and thereby maybe to de-emotionalize often emotional debates in isolated groups. The goal is not least to provide knowledge for political action. All this is becoming ever more important since the climate of debate is becoming more populistic. And since anti-intellectual voices are becoming increasingly loud. One focus in our last funding phase was developing dialogue with politicians and stakeholders from all parties and from different religions, ideological communities, and also NGOs. And all of them with a high degree of professional interest in our research findings. We regularly disseminated these findings in interviews, articles, podia, and consultation meetings. Particularly interesting were issues for the public, interesting were issues such as integration and migration, the communication of values, religious freedom, and not least, religious policy. With our focus on religious policy, we, managed, we have managed to raise awareness of a policy field that had, had received only little attention in politics in Germany, whether in federal, state, or local politics. One conclusion from the findings in, in several disciplines that are working in our uh, cluster was that religious policy can no longer be neglected. The political domain in Germany lacks a concept as how religious interests can be negotiated constructively. Whether it is the building of mosques, the headscarf or the crucifix, 
church employment law of circumcision, the political de domain, often reacts without clear political ideas. There are no concepts and instead the decisions are often left to the courts. This happens even though our representative surveys of the cluster, for instance, demonstrate that the German population is not prepared for religious diversity. People are far more afraid of plurality in Germany than they are in other countries. So this is the content of our research on religious policy. And by disseminating findings like these, researchers in the cluster have been asked to advise ministries, parliamentary groups, and committees, foundation, and interest groups in religious institutions. Our scholars also held many lectures at political and church events and in educational institutions. And also politicians have drawn on the empirical findings provided by the cluster in interviews and also in parliamentary debates. The cluster also has itself invited people for discussions in lecture series or for instance, in an all day open lecture open air lecture theater in Münster with very lively discussions on topics of religion. We also have published the first general volume in Germany on the topic of religious policy and it brings together for the first time positions both from the academic world and from politics and religious groups. Last year, we have started another program, a new one, together with the School of Journalism in Munich. It is the first in-service training program in Germany in religious journalism. The program is designed to qualify media professionals to report on religions in pluralized societies in a nuanced and critical manner. It is the first of its kind in the German speaking world and comprises seven modules taught at locations in Germany and abroad that are of relevance to religion, from Berlin to Frankfurt and from Vienna to Jerusalem. Conflicts over issues to do with religious policy have increased in Western societies, while religiosity at the same time has declined. The religious landscape has therefore become less clear. So the cluster of excellence is offering this new training program in order to increase specialist knowledge about religious diversity among young journalists. This is all the more important because the media have a lasting influence on how religions are, are perceived in our society. Well, these examples hopefully show how research communication from the humanities and social sciences realized in a variety of transfer formats might have some impact on society. The infrastructure, infrastructure supporting these, all these activities is our Center for Research Communication, which I'm head of, and which was integrated into our cluster already in 2009. We promote dialogue between scholars and representatives from many public fields and with the general public. We also work, as I said, in many formats. The centerpiece is the national and international media work supplemented by social media, of course, now complemented by the named training program. We also organize other formats ranging from cons consultations to educational materials up to lecture series, exhibitions in museums, for instance, cultural events and discussions for members of the public of various age groups. These are often organized with partners such as museums, publishing houses, trusts, education instit educational institutions, colleges of journalism, cinemas, choirs, as well as schools. This has long met with great interest from the public. For instance, each press release generates an average of 10 media responses at home and abroad. Our success is that is what we believe is due to our ability to identify a news value, the social relevance in all our research subjects. And then we present them in a, new te in a text form that media would really want to use, often prepared on multimedia basis. The concept of our center was new to the humanities and social sciences in Germany and since, has since become a model for, for institutions in the humanities here. 
And maybe one last point, the transfer activities will be on religion will be continued during the next years on a campus of religions at Münster University. It will be the only one of its kind in Germany. It will bring together Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox Christian and Islamic theology, as well as institutions of non-denominational religious studies at the Münster University and thereby promote interdisciplinary academic exchange. But the campus will not only bring together scholars in the city of the Peace of Westphalia here, it will also become a venue for public communication on religion, for the exchange between leading national and international representatives from the academic world, but also from political, religious and ideological communities and NGOs, the media, culture, and also the arts, maybe. So the campus is supposed to be a neutral pet platform for mutual understanding in the conflict-laden field of religion and politics. So in spite of an increasing number of anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim attacks in Germany, for instance, we do not get up, give up hope that dialogue on religion conflicts is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Viola. So, Paula Ireni, now it's your turn. Uh, the floor is with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you also from my part. Thank you uh, hugely for inviting me and uh, having me here. I think this is really an amazing um, issue and, and debate we can have. It's certainly a very timely and important topic. As uh, you introduced me, introduced me before, yeah, I speak from several perspectives, I think, today. One would be that I am a sociologist. I'm chair of sociology and gender studies at the University of Munich. But I also speak as, not officially in, in, in the name of, but through a certain experience of being board member of the German Sociological Association now for many years. Um, and... Um, so I also bring in the experience of being part of a big uh, scientific uh, academic association um, within social science in the German and European context. And finally, I also bring in uh, rather also now a wide and lengthy experience with uh, being a scholar in the field of gender studies. And as some of you might be aware of, certainly in the Brazilian context, I'm sure you are, but also internationally in other parts, gender studies is a field that has had a lot of kind of public visibility in uh, also partly not very good ways, I would say. So gender studies is one of the, I think, most uh, debated uh, fields of academic inquiry and research and teaching um, in the public context with a lot of polemics and um, debate is often maybe a too friendly word for what's going on there. So also partly really um, attacks and uh, very dubious politicization in the public field. So kind of bringing all of these several institutional experiences together, what I'd like to focus on is the concept of translation. I think the context, concept or the idea of translation um, brings together quite well what I think is really important to think about and to keep in mind and to try to achieve in terms of the public communication of science. Translation in many ways. Um, so a translation, a notion of translating um, scientific research, higher third level education, knowledge towards what we might call the public and civil society, but also translating the other way around um, issues of political, social relevance, social problems, uh, inquiries from what we call maybe the civil society, public realm into research um, can be understood in several ways. And I think that's um, uh, interesting and important to acknowledge that, that this um, translation has several dimensions and issues. And I'd like to kind of lay out a few or at least name them and see if you would agree and if we this would be interesting to 
debate. So I think one of the issues regarding translation is perhaps maybe <clears throat> very obvious, but is always uh, under kind of debate and has to be kind of readdressed and reassessed all the time is, and I would make this point a very strong one, that it is important that we all keep in mind that there is an important difference between what is on the one hand, scientific, academic knowledge, and on the other hand, what is political, social, economic, cultural logics and dimensions. So I think it is important to kind of keep in mind that these are really separate logics, which of course are co-constitutive, mutually intertwined and entangled. Um, and in order to be so, they also have to be separated. So what I'm actually saying is a very perhaps trivial point, but I think a very important one that academic uh, and scientific knowledge is one thing and other dimensions, logics and dynamics are quite another thing. And what, my, what Viola, I think, very astutely and correctly pointed out is that uh, what one might call populist politics and populist dynamics from many sides of the political spectrum tend to collapse this difference. So populism has many aspects, but one important characteristic of populist political mobilization is um, that they or that these logics tend to minimize or even call for the collapse of the difference. For example, by stating that um, all science is political or that science should be driven by and uh, oriented towards uh, the need of the people, the public, um, political needs, etc. And we see this in many places around the world and we see this also increasingly in Europe. So I think it is in itself an, an element of modern rational kind of societies to defend um, science and academia from these all too simple populist logics, which is not to say that a public engagement uh, is wrong in itself, not at all. But I just again want to stress that if we are to engage, for example, as public sociology or public science, as the Brazilian Society for um, Public Science does so, and I think very importantly and brilliantly does so, it is important to have a step of translation, just not to, not to say all science is in itself political or should be. So having stated this, I think more concretely, translation of what academia science is on the one hand towards the political, the, the public, etc. Uh, concretely, so these translation has several steps or dimensions. I think one very important one in that sense is to understand um, that, for example, media as a term of translation plays an immense, import, immensely important role here. And that each media aspect of engaging with the public has its specific logic and time, for example. So as also already Viola pointed out, if we communicate what we do, for example, in research, in academia, we have to address these on terms that are fitting with and suitable for specific media logics targeting specific audiences. So we cannot put out simply an academic study and expect everyone to understand it or to even find it or even find it interesting. So we have to kind of translate what we do into specific media logics, which is tricky because as you know, probably, or I hope you're aware of, um, academic logics tend to always be more complex or not easily fit the needs of media, especially not in a context of social media, which are very visually driven, which are very fast, which are very volatile, um, and which are not gate kept uh, to certain audiences. So I think what we have to learn within academia more than we do so far, and I'm sure that institutions such as SPBC or also what Viola um, is head of can help to professionalize these understanding 
um, that engaging with a certain kind of public from uh, academia is something that requires specific knowledge and skills and reflection and reflexivity. It is not simply to put some research out there. Um, and also, I think what comes with that is our responsibility to kind of educate, I hope, um, the uh, kind of public and the audiences that what we do in academia, in science, in research is not simply um, a kind of TV show or is easily adaptable for Instagram or Facebook or whatever, but really requires to accept that academia, that research has, again, its own logic. So I think media is really important there and there's a lot, a lot uh, to learn. I think we also, in this sense, we need more research and more translation of research um, that allows us to understand which uh, audiences we are talking to, uh, which media we are talking through, and um, how to address the specific audiences. So we tend to generally think of, you know, the public, the audience, the um, society out there, the civil society. And I think this is not specific or not detailed enough. And there is a lot of research uh, as far as I know on these issues. And I think it would be important in terms of professionalization of media or of science communication to be more research and evidence base so we understand and, and are able to professionalize again um, who we are talking to, how to do so, and how to um, make the best use of the media uh, we would use. I think what translation also would imply for me, <clears throat> coming from a lot of experience in this sense is, and I think this is a huge challenge, which is very difficult to achieve, and I say this self-critically, is how to achieve um, the communication of complexity in a simple way. So I think translation uh, would mean to defend, to deepen, to to, to communicate that scientific academic knowledge is necessarily complex and to defend this complexity, but how to do so in simple ways, how to make this understandable, how to reach out um, to different audiences uh, in simple, and I'm not, I, I'm using this in a very positive way. I mean, how to tell simple stories understandable, accessible, clear uh, uh, input, uh, clear, uh, how, how to make this clear, and how to make complexity a clear narrative. I think this is really a huge challenge. I think it is achievable. I think we can do so. But it's much harder than we in academia tend to think. Um, and it's also much harder than many people in, you know, doing professional media communication think. Uh, so I think that's that's a huge um, challenge we face there. And I think one answer to that, but this is very obvious because I am a sociologist and I work in empirical social sciences, and I think it, it connects to what Viola already said. One way, one possible way to achieve this um, simple complexity narrative is to start and always get back to empirical everyday life. So it is possible, I hope and I think, to communicate what we find out in research and what we do in research by connecting it once and once and again and again to the everyday lives of all sorts of people. And I say this also coming from gender studies, where I think um, we are often misperceived as doing things that are detached from the real social problems on real, of real and empirical normal people, you know, that we are kind of uh, lobbies or elites far detached from the real problems of real problems people. And I'd say the, all the contrary is the case. Actually, we do research, uh, for example, in gender studies or in sociology as Biola also said in their um, research, you know, religion and uh, society, so do we do a lot of research that is totally <laughs> infused with and engaged with the real problems of real people. But of course, to do research is not to do policy. 
So I think, again, there is much translation needed and it can be done. Uh, when we uh, root science communication in, as I said, the everyday life of, um, of all of us, of real people. And I think this can be achieved. And one good example where this is achieved, and this would be my final point concluding, is the contemporary COVID um, corona crisis, where we have seen that not only for, at least in the, in the German and European context, we have seen that not only medicine and virologists and um, medical experts and public health experts are uh, very much present in the media, which of course they are, and this is very good and correctly so, but there is a huge visibility and, and, and demand for, for example, social science and sociologists to explain and to understand and to perhaps even guide all of us through these very difficult and critical and crisis times by explaining and doing research and again translating what we know about the social effects of this crisis and the social dimensions, gender, inequality, um, everyday uh, um, practices, etc. So we have seen that sociology and social science can contribute and does contribute and hopefully does make um, the situation, um, does contribute to also managing these very difficult situation we are in. So that might be a good example to discuss all the aspects I have mentioned. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Paula. So uh, uh, just reminding you all that uh, we will have uh, plenty of time for questions and discussion after uh, Yuri's presentation. So please, Yuri, the floor is yours. Can you see me? I think you see me. It's OK, Luisa? Sim, sim. Ah, sim. Perfect. Perfect. Then, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with such uh, brilliant colleagues. I'm very honored. I appreciate the, this invitation from SBPC. And uh, I will talk uh, uh, in a very um, uh, similar points. I will touch very similar points to my previous colleagues, but uh, situating them in the Brazilian context. So I, I think it's it's perfect that my my talk is the last one. And uh, let me share my screen. Uh, yes, this way and this way. Please, Luisa, tell me if it's okay if you are seeing my my screen. So I will try to, to, to think how to make such kind of translation, such kind of uh, engaging participative uh, di uh, dialogues uh, in a contest in, in Brazil in which we are in a perfect storm uh, uh, with infodemic uh, crisis of public trust toward all the institutions and very serious uh, structural problem in science communication. Uh, the first uh, aspect is that uh, in Brazil, uh, this information is mainly fueled by strong political forces and interest groups. Uh, so it became a very serious problem, both for public health and environment and democracy itself. Uh, university and researchers made huge and beautiful efforts in this uh, pandemic. Uh, to organize campaign of, of information, of communication, both to inform people and to defend science and strengthen the public confidence toward research institution. However, uh, such campaigns uh, often were not based on data, on public perception data coming from Brazil, were not made by listening to people before talking. So they failed to be effective in many, in many situations because they did not take into account the social and political context, nor the public perception of science and technology. Uh, I will show here briefly that actually an, an anti-science social movement does not exist in Brazil. We have strong problems with conspiracy theories, 
with disinformation and with strong rejection to specific claims, aspect, theories, or areas of science, but they are not connecting uh, among themselves in the shape of a real social movement. Actually, all the data, we have a lot of recent data made both by ethnographic observation, interviews, uh, qualitative techniques, and survey. Uh, several of these data were made in collaboration with the National Institute for the uh, uh, Public Communication of Science Technology, uh, led by Luisa Maserani here. And uh, th our data showed that actually a lot of communication strategies uh, used by research institution, university, and scientists, individual scientists, were based on naive assumption, like the idea that the fear of science fueled ignorance and the ignorance generates hate toward science or scientists. Uh, these are very old model of on public perception of science that were imagining that low interest uh, bring people to lower understanding of science or low scientific literacy. And this means uh, worse attitudes towards science technology. Our data show that these models are not good models. And that when we speak about the right of people to know the right to science and culture, as previewed by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, we focus too much on the transmission of information. And we forget that it is right, it's a right to participate in the scientific life, the cultural life, in a real scientific democracy, a scientific uh, citizenship. I mean that our real problem is not a problem of ignorance. Ignorance in Brazil is being more and more an effect of polarization, of distrust, of uh, political hates, of economical interest, and not the cause of the problem. This information build ignorance and is not the opposite. People do not believe to conspiracy theory only because of ignorance. They believe in conspiracy theories because they lost social capital and social trust and social solidarity. So I will not uh, expose all, all our data here because of the time, but I will say that in Brazil, the confidence and trust of people towards science, scientists, and public university is still very strong. Actually, Brazilian people trust scientists more than any other social actor, more than military people, more than religious leader, more than the media, and trust political university in dark science and uh, ask for more support to science and technology in Brazil. And we also see that public perception of people towards science do not depend strongly on scientific literacy or on access to information only, but mainly to the kind and level of social engagement and political engagement of people. People with very low social and political engagement tends to have either very pessimistic view towards science, and they are a very, very few people in Brazil, less than 5%, or too much euphoric attitudes towards science, like science is a miracle, is a magic. Uh, people who are engaged with social problems uh, used to have a, a more equilibrated attitude towards science, and they are the majority in Brazil. So uh, a lot of science communication in these pandemics uh, did not take into account the social context, the polarization, the crisis of trust, and send general messages like wear a mask that, that can have very different meanings or no meaning at all in several important contexts in Brazil. Uh, so what does it mean to stay at home for indigenous people who are invaded by the huge invasion since decades, bringing several kinds of health problems much before COVID-19 was a strong problem. What does it mean stay at home or social distancing to people living in rural areas or in peripheric area areas in which you can have the needs to, to have four, six, eight people in one small room, for example, or then have to work in very crowded place to survive? What can mean trust your government in context in which governments mainly manifestate itself as a force of violence and abuse. Uh, so a lot of messages focused to increase 
trust towards sciences were not well focused because people already trusted science and they needed another kind of communication. They needed another kind of engagement and participation. So uh, we know today that the main, uh, the strong uh, effect toward this information circulation that have uh, so sociological and psychological processes like motivated reasoning, cognitive polyphagia, and radical political polarization we see in so many countries and the religious, increasing religious fundamentalism in Brazil. So the real problem in this context is not only access to information, access to solid and, and uh, uh, true information, but a lack of social capital, the lack or, or the failure of social solidarity and the building, the proposital building of distrust. So we need more to foster connections and rebuild trust than to inject more and more information in this disinformation storm and tempest. So today, participation and scientific citizenship are more imp important than ever. But how can we engage people? How can we foster productive participation in this context in which polarization, distrust, conspiracies seem to dominate the public sphere and collective uh, imagination? Uh, usually, a lot of scientists thinks that the right way is to destroy myths, uh, injecting tr uh, truths. And uh, this is based on naive epistemological position or on bad sociological interpretation of our contest. And this may affect severely our interaction with the publics. Uh, so the approach that uh, we build trust against the myths of people is very complicated and in some cases have a backlash effect with strong. Uh, the idea of some scientists to see themselves as crusaders in a holy war against anti-science is also misunderstood and, and brings to several collateral effects. Or to see science journalism or science communication only as a cheerleader or a microphone for science. Uh, this is very delicate. And a lot of science communication is biased by a biological, sociological, or technological reductionism or triumphalism that are also dangerous. So we must think that if we want to diffuse scientific culture, we have to remember that culture is not the same as the knowledge. Culture is made by myths, by rituals, by symbols. It's a compass to behavior. It's not only knowledge, it's wisdom, for example. And it, in culture are embedded power relationships, inequalities, and the problem of inclusion. So the first things we try to think in, in, uh, in my groups, uh, when we try to cope with this information in these pandemics, is that our publics must be treated not as, as patients, like victim of some uh, sickness of lack of rationality, a lack of information, lack of knowledge or literacy, but they are agents, they are in action. So we have to take into account what they can do actually with science and technology and with, with science communication. Uh, and if uh, we analyze this, we discover that people ob obviously signify, record, interpret, they reinvent our science communication and they do not obey. They use science communication uh, input to build and invent uh, clutches, to invent other things. Uh, they make a cognitive, epistemological, technical and political hacking of what we communicate. Um, so uh, we build at my university, the Federal University of Minas Gerais, a course, uh, a postgraduate course in science communication made for teachers, communicators, and scientists to be together. And during the pandemics, our lessons were stopped because of the isolations. And then we invented a task force of voluntary students and professors and scientists and journalists uh, to make information and to build solidarity against COVID-19. How do we, do we do this? We decided that our strategy was not to talk to people, but we talk with people. Our strategy was not to produce information for some audience, but to produce from communities and specific groups, living, uh, taking into account their specificities and peculiarities. 
Uh, we decided that a good science communication is a communication that first listen to people, then talk with people. And we decided that our main strategy was not to give the data, how many deaths, how many new cases every day, but only to transmit something that we can do together to fight the effects of this pandemic. So we listened it to rural areas, to indigenous people, to favelas, to a lot of refugees that we have now in Brazil, uh, from Haiti, from Africa, uh, from indigenous people from Venezuela. And uh, uh, we try to interpret scientific culture, not as literacy, not only as a knowledge, not only as having access to information, but to a practice uh, of citizenship. So citizenship is not only a list of rights, it's a capacity to act, it's an agency. So science engagement, engagement is not how to invite people to stimulate curiosity, to be interested in science, but engagement is about how much are we willing to delegate and share power with people. So our idea is that we are not Prometheus. We do not bring the fire, the light of science uh, top down to people, but we must build an hermeneutics of science in society. We are the ambassadors and eventually the thieves. Uh, you cannot cope with this information only by injecting more information in pandemic. It's a lot of information. You do not resolve post-trat issues, conspiracy theories, only by explaining science or by showing the light of truth and reason to people who supposedly do not have access to this. So we decided to try to foster diversity in science communication, race, gender, religions. Uh, to, we try to learn from our publics and from our epistemologists, our, our uh, other cosmologists. We try to build citizenship and not only to foster literacy, sharing power, sharing decision making, sharing data, and reinventing the co production of science communication with citizen science, with open science, with tinkering labs. So we are trying with this task force to make science a part of democracy. We do not only bring science to the people, we try to bridge people into scientific citizenship. And so we spoke in these months uh, with the elder people in rural area that told us why you say stay at home, I cannot stay at home. I have to go to the city to take my money. So explain me what have I, to, I, I have to do, uh, what I must do when I go to the city. Do not say stay at home, I know it. We didn't say stay at home to indigenous people. We try to organize a solidarity movement, collective production of information from them to other indigenous people. And with the refugees, we translate this instruction to make masks, effective masks in Chinese, in uh, Creole, in French, in Arabic, and in Spanish for the indigenous refugees from Venezuela, always in contact and in dialogue with this kind of social group. This was our strategies. I think it's quite uh, coherent with, with what my colleagues were saying before. So I thank you all for listening and uh, open, we can open the debate, I think, Luisa. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Yuri. So now is the time for some discussion. If all the panelists can turn on the, the video, please, Paula and Viola. If you can join us. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> so we have uh, many questions from um, from uh, YouTube. So here are, uh, uh, I suggest that I, I, I uh, raise some of the questions and then you can go around and answering and then we have another round of questions and then uh, we, we go on uh, until the, we have the time. So uh, we have for Viola, we have two questions. Uh, so the first one uh, is, uh, is actually the two ones that I put you in the, in the chat. I'm just reading for the, the other people uh, have an idea what is, it is about. But uh, the question one for Viola is, do you believe that human right philosophy must take place in academy? If yes, who might do it? I mean, which type of professional might uh, do it? 
So this is the first, first question for Viola. And then the second one is, is a longer one. Uh, Professor Viola, right now we, we see the ascension of an anti-science movement influenced by an American marketist uh, propaganda mailing against China. This discourse has great adherence among evangelic extremists, mostly Pentecostal and neo-Pentecostal supporter of Bolsonaro's government. Our vaccination rate are decreasing for all diseases, and we fear it may uh, have major impact in the upcoming vaccination campaign for COVID-19. Do you have any insights on how to open the dialogue with the specific group heavily influenced by their leader visions? And I suggest that uh, although this question was not addressed to Yuri, I suggest that after Viola answered the question, uh, Yuri can comment uh, a bit about it. And for uh, Paula, there is uh, actually a provocative comment. Uh, so Paula, you refer to the complexity of science and the fact that science has its uh, own organization, which lead me to think uh, in a science-centric approach of science communication. However, research, researchers and science communicators, including the German researcher Hans Peter Peters, has been calling attention that media is also complex and has its own organization. It's actually about two different cultures, which need to understand more one and the other for a better dialogue between scientists and society. The own term translation, uh, which you referred uh, many times in your presentation, has been challenged uh, too. Uh, for example, the researcher Jen Fanstock uh, referred to different discourses instead of uh, translation, and she used more the term accommodating science instead of translating. So I think that uh, we can start with Viola, then go to Yuri, then Paula, and we have read many other questions to the second round. Viola, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> I will try to make it short since there are even more questions. Um, well, of course, uh, research on human rights should definitely be, um, should take place in the academic world from my point of view. And as you write, philosophy might be the first discipline that could would deal with it. And uh, we have um, researchers here, for instance, in Münster and the whole of Germany doing this. But of course, also other disciplines like law or theology would deal um, with this topic. And of course, not only in an abstract way, but with regard to the question how human rights are protected in societies and in which countries and in which they are not. And also with regard to our topics of religion in society, it is always and often a question. Um, the human right of religious freedom is the basis of, of all we are doing here. If we talk about religious policy, this is the main base the, the ground on, on that we stand there. So um, definitely yes, and um, as many uh, disciplines as possible in the social sciences and also the uh, humanities. Um, with regard to the second question, um, we have to say in Germany, we, we do not have this, um, you can't at the moment, so far at least, you can't compare the religious landscape with the one in your country. The, the amount of um, evangelical groups is not as big as in your country. And <clears throat> it, um, and we also probably have a, a more moderate government at the moment. So uh, I can't uh, compare it at all with our situation here. Therefore, our experience is definitely um, a different one. But um, um, I also think that Yuri could be uh, the one to answer it because we also in Germany have this, this idea of citizen uh, science here. It's a strong development within the uh, research communication area. And of course, it is important to find um, not only well-informed uh, citizens, but um, uh, citizens that re are really engaged in these um, uh, topics and but in order in order to, um, to to create an amount of of or to find those groups um, if you really want to push it it actually will need probably a lot of 
uh, money and a lot of uh, people and professionals in communication to start campaigns. Um, that means not only information campaigns in the sense of giving information, as you said, but in order to, um, to, to um, start with uh, uh, panels and podia and um, and and other um, ideas of group work in order to introduce uh, in many areas of a country um, people into um, into another perspective on these um, ideas in this case on vaccination maybe that's enough for now okay so yuri uh the floor is yours but maybe you can add in your uh answer your comment a question that was added after uh which is professor yuri perhaps you could be interesting for the discussion to debate the definitions of science in society and also the definition of ignorance in your presentation so if you can comment also the anti-vaccine uh, movement and the this last uh, question uh, fine. Yes, anti-vaccine movement is becoming stronger and stronger in Brazil, as well as conspiracy theories, climate negationism. So I'm not saying that we don't have a problem. We have a huge problem. What I'm saying is that this problem is not caused by the lack of knowledge of people or lack of rationality of people. The ignorance, uh, and then I'll explain what is ignorance, but the lack of knowledge is a product. It's a byproduct of proposital building of disinformation and distrust is, is, is an effect of the strong attacks we are, uh, we are uh, being through in Brazil, and they are attacks mainly against democracy. Science is only one of the targets, but is a sub-target. They attack public university because they want to attack democracy and all the institutions. So journalists are also attacked, not only scientists. So judges are also attacked, not only scientists and journalists. All the pillars of democracies are under attacks by conspiracy theories and disinformation. And the ignorance, the lack of good access to good, to, to good information is mainly an effect of this and not the major cause. Uh, this is the first point. The second point is why I say that we don't have an anti-science movement, why I am against uh, identifying the problem as an anti-science movement. Because when you see at the data, when you don't see it as general naive assumption, our people do not understand, they hate us. But you go to the data, you go and listen to people, you see that the people who are against vaccination are not the same people who are flat herter. And that flat herter, I usually believe in the problem of uh, climate change. You see that a lot of people in Brazil that believe in pseudoscience, like astrology, uh, they are supportive of science or even more supportive than the average Brazilians. So these are disconnected phenomena. People are victim, yes, of strong anti-scientific stances and problems, but they are not anti-science against science as a whole. They still trust male scientists, but they enter into conflict with specific claims or specific areas of science or specific norm when, they are when these claims and norms enter in conflict with their identities, their religious beliefs, their real needs, and their political position. So uh, uh, the, the, uh, the data analysis shows that, for example, the factors who increase your chance to, to be a climate negationist are mainly political positions. And the factor who would bring you to be against vaccination are mailing the contact with conspiracy theories in Brazil. And in every country is different. So in every country, you have different position. Anti-vaccination movement in Italy began as a left people movement and after a populist movement. In Brazil, was a strategy of the far right groups uh, to build distrust of people toward the institutions. So it's a totally different connotation. Then you do not are against vaccination because you are ignorant. You become ignorant because you fall in this social group against vaccination. And this social group is very different from the other social groups. So there is no anti-science. There is anti-vax, flat earther, uh, Canon people and so on, and of course with different psychological and sociological context. In general, in Brazil, there is still a very, very, very strong support 
to science in all social groups, very strong. It's a very few people who are, but they are very strong in the social network. So the scientists read the social network and become scared. Uh, and, and thinks that everyone hates us. It's not, it's not true, at least not in Brazil, not yet. And about ignorance, a, a lot of people for a lot of years studies, studied the public understanding of science uh, in terms of scientific literacy. You make questions to people about science, if DNA is inside the vegetables, if electron is bigger than the atom or not. And based on this data, coded as scientific literacy in a very bad way, they uh, imagined that scientific literacy was directly and linearly correlated to good attitudes. We demonstrated that this is false. So the lack of scientific literacy does not bring people to a negative attitude towards science. On the contrary, in Brazil, uh, people with very, very low level of education used to be very strongly supportive towards science, very optimist. This is quite typical of all peripheral countries. In Africa is, is the same way, in Argentina is similar. In the rich countries is a different trend, is a different correlation. But in the poor countries and developing countries, as they were called before, uh, uh, this is the situation. So what I was saying at this, the lack of good access to good information is an effect of the social dynamics in the networks, of the platformization and mediatization of science and politization of science and network, and not caused by low scientific literacy, because scientific literacy is not the best factor to, uh, to, um, to know the chance of people to be against or, or in favor of science. I think that I answered the, the question. I, I, yeah, I think so. So meanwhile, I, I give uh, the floor to Paula. Yuri, I invite you to read the, the chat in this Zoom because there are three questions for you in Portuguese. I will try to translate later when we, you answer it, but uh, it's good that you read <laughs> and prepare your thoughts. So Paula, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm really fascinated by the comments and questions. Uh, thanks a lot to the questions, uh, although I don't, I don't know if they are as provocative, but uh, super interesting yet thought provoking. And also for the comments of the other panelists, really super interesting. Um, I think that, you know, what jewelry, jewelry just said is really a great example of what I meant uh, by stating that science is complex. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, we don't get all the, the results never in empirical science, be they physics or be they social science, never are like always this and then that and always there if that. So we have really complex dynamics because the world, be it the physical, the biological, the social one are inherently complex. So as you just said, you know, what might be the status quo in Brazil is very different in Italy, is different in Germany, is different in the US, etc. So that means, and that would be part of the question for me already commenting on that, that means that probably scientific literacy would necessarily imply not only as you portrayed it, maybe, or even made a caricature of, I'm not sure to say people should know the facts, but we all need to understand that the world is complex and scientific literacy, if we want to call it like that, would, that's why I'm so you know, insistent on that point. Um, have to do a lot with understanding that we have to face that the world and we ourselves are complex. And that is part of what being scientifically literate might mean. But the question was um, um, accommodating instead of translating sounds interesting. I'm afraid I cannot really speak to that since I'm not sure what the difference between these concepts actually are. To accommodate sounds not so promising to me, but maybe I'm just ignorant in this context because I'm not sure what exactly the author means. I think that accommodation sounds at least like, you know, a kind of one way thing, science accommodating to or the public accommodating to. And I think that translation for me still, but I may be wrong as far as I uh, know the research and the debates, translation is the most kind of, I think, empirically sound way of understanding that we all have to 
kind of understand the different logics or the different cultures. Very true. I agree with what you know. The, the, the question is that yes, media is its own culture. Politics has its own culture. Academia has its own culture. Economics has its own culture, etc. Yes, I agree. Thus, translation, I think, is key. Not only as I, I don't want to, and I don't think it's possible even to accommodate in a strong sense, I may be, you know, understanding it wrong, but rather to mutually translate and generate kind of a space of translation, all of us each uh, together coming from these different logics. So I'm sorry, I cannot speak to the accommodation term, I would stick to translating exactly because of the different uh, logics of these different systems, as I would call them. And I, if I may have one question, uh, follow up uh, question on what Jury again said, I am um, to put it provocatively, I am wondering if citizen science is not again, another myth we are dealing with uh, in this very complex and, you know, increasingly kind of existential terrain, you know, of being attacked, of having governments that, you know, really are attacking institutions, a public that is increasingly attacking persons, academics, etc. So it's really an urgent problem. So to put it differently, what if the citizens in themselves are, which they are not necessarily, but I'm just, you know, saying, what if they are anti-Semitic, racist, sexist, um, etc. Um, what do we do with, you know, participatory science, which we do not want to speak to or over, but with, and it's a, you know, all these nice rhetoric you yourself presented, and I, you know, could be more sympathetic on the, you know, rhetoric level, but isn't that quite a myth we are making ourselves about the public, about the audience, about our engagement there, just, you know, to put it out there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. So we have uh, many questions, actually. Uh, we will have, uh, for sure, another round of questions, but I'm, I'm going to split for not having so many different topics. But still, I want to give the, the floor for each of the panelists. So there is one comment saying, so important to focus on empirical, empirical data, as Professor Paula and Professor Yuri say, and connect results to everyday experience of people when communicating, it's only a comment. Uh, and uh, then there is, uh, I guess, for Viola, uh, there is a, a student from international relations. He's, or he or she says, uh, I would like to know if Brazil and German uh, have, uh, have conference talks uh, which uh, that uh, the debate the issue of religion. And if yes, which are the men, uh, the stronger uh, topics in discussion? So for Yuri, we have actually three different questions in Portuguese. Let's see, it's the ones that I put in the chat here. Let's try to translate for helping the, the people who are actually uh, outside the, the Zoom uh, uh, system for understanding what you're talking about. So question one was uh, whether Yuri believe that the Academy should, as an obligation, uh, have a, a, a project of communication and engagement with society in, in any way? And if yes, what kind of a project would be interesting? That is, uh, whether communication, uh, science communication and public engagement should be an obligation. Uh, the question two is about uh, these uh, political militants uh, in which we live uh, made me a question about the, the question uh, of the research in any stage of uh, uh, his or her formal career has as a public uh, figure. Uh, so what do you think about being a, a public figure as a, a scientist? And then finally, the question three is how to talk about uh, clarify fake news without uh, putting the, the arrogance of the truth, the absolute truths of science, but also showing the fragilities. So I give maybe to, uh, first to Viola to comment and then to Yuri and then if Paula will also want to to comment and then we have the second round at uh, the third round of questions. Yeah, Viola is with you. 
Uh, okay, uh, I'm not sure whether I got it right, but uh, it also seems to me that it's not so much a question about research communication. If I got it right, it was the question whether scholars in Brazil and Germany exchange their research on religion. Was that right? Because it, it, he or she, the student, was actually referring more about uh, public conferences. And uh, if there are uh, this conference, uh, what are the main topics, the stronger uh, topics related to religion? But you're right, it's not about science communication. I know, but, but uh, well, public conferences again would be, of course, um, um, one format of, of public. Con but actually, I don't, I don't know about that, whether I know there, there are um, connections between the academia, um, of course, between Brazil. Um, and Germany, for instance, in theology very strongly and so on. But I don't know much about that. Actually, I, I would like to add two more points to research communication to our former um, points, because what, what Paula said and what, what she was asked again, I can only agree on this analysis of different logics in those different um, uh, social systems like uh, academic world, media world, politics, etc. Um, my impression very often is, often is that at universities, one point is forgotten that there are professionals already who know how to um, transfer um, uh, knowledge between these worlds. But when it comes for at a university, um, if there is an, a new amount of money and it comes to the question whether you would get more scholars into, um, into the institutions, or maybe at least one or two or three professionals on communication. In the most cases, it's decided that, that we have even more scholars, more, more research projects, and um, non-professionals um, who know already how to, um, to bridge these, these different um, worlds. Because, of course, it's important to, to give trainings to um, scholars so that they have at least some idea of how um, media, um, media people work, and that or politicians, for instance, that it doesn't make sense to invite a politician um, during a parliamentary week, for instance, or all these little details, there are thousands, how people work in museums and so on. But there is a whole professional area in every of our countries of people who know how to do it. It's just that very often universities don't um, invest in, um, in people like that or don't come to the idea. It's a little bit that I always often have the impression that scholars believe I know how to talk, I know how to write, I'm, I'm, very, I'm smart enough, I can do it myself. But this has, it, it is a true profession, it's a question, for instance, of different text genres, of different, uh, well, image genres. For instance, in media work, it's so important to anticipate what could happen if I, um, I simplify this complexity in this way or in that way, this, this research topic in this or that way. Can I, um, can I use the technical term here or how would I translate it here or should I give it in addition and so on. It's, it's um, from my point of view, I, I've been journalist for, for 10 years before I started here 10 years ago. It's, it's all very, uh, very much a question of, of, of technical um, things um, and, and scholars tend to discuss it. They, they, they have started to discuss how communication with the, this public out there could happen, but they, they always stop at the point where it becomes practical. And if you just go in it, as, as we've been doing now for 10 years, um, being part of the research uh, association, once you start to do it, it, it works. So uh, <laughs> it's sometimes a bit uh, sad <laughs> that um, it, it often keeps on this abstract level. Maybe stop here. Okay, Viola. Uh, Yuri, the floor is yours. Okay, it's a lot of stuff. I, I, I try to be very, very uh, brief. <laughs> uh, first, yes, uh, no doubt the Academy has the, 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 the obligation uh, to, to build scientific citizenships and to uh, foster science communication. But two things. First of all, it's not an obligation of the individual scientists. A lot of scientists feel themselves with a lot of pressure because they're not communicate well enough. It's an institutional obligation. Uh, and second, it's not only an obligation, it's a need. 
it's, uh, it's crucial, it's vital for contemporary science to communicate with society. It's not only a need of the publics to be informed. It's not only the right of people to be informed. It's a physiological necessity uh, 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 of scientists and science to make better uh, interactions with the policymakers, with the enterprises, uh, with the public sphere. Uh, it's not only the right of people. To, today, more and more scientists uh, claim their right to communicate to people, to be listened. In this polarization situation, it's the opposite situation than before. Uh, before, we had the scientists, the science being uh, pressure, uh, being asked to, uh, as a philanthropic act to, to democratize science. Today, it's, it's almost the opposite. People have the duty to be informed. They need this not the right. And scientists claim the right to be listened by policymakers, for example. This is the main problem, uh, in my opinion. So yes, academy must do this, no doubt. And, uh, and uh, how do this? We, we are doing this. Actually, I think that we are too much pessimistic. I saw in Brazil, huge, beautiful, moving efforts of institution and scientists, individual scientists to be public, to go public, to accept the challenge, to, to in really interact in the debate. It's a real, real, real huge movement that is, is beginning and the pandemics increased a lot of this. So we have now very, very famous uh, digital influencer in Brazil that are science communicators like Atila Yamarino and so on, not, not only. We are very, very famous scientists who stay in the media all the time. And the university in Brazil are among the best in the world to make extensions, in my opinion, and also based in part of the data that the Luisa International Research showed recently in PLOS. So we have a lot of, of action, actually. It's not enough because we are huge and we are in a huge problem, but we are doing a lot of things. And that after this will connect with what Paula were, were, were saying that I, I would say that is a bore trick, uh, but I go back to this. And the other things is, is was that uh, the political uh, activism. Uh, yes, and also this is uh, obviously a need. Uh, we need scientists who wants to be also public intellectuals. Uh, we need scientists that stop using the old trick of the, the white coat. We are the impartial, objective, universal truth coming from nature. We need scientists that accept this challenge of making politics accepting the science is a part of politics and the politics is a part of science. In my opinion, uh, the old rhetoric of uh, universal objectivity and neutrality uh, does not function anymore because science unavoidably is pushed by politician inside. So science is automatic, automatically politicized in a political moment. So uh, politician will say, science says that no climate change is happening. Scientists say that so scientists must react in a different way with a different strategy that is not only uh, the white immaculate coat of objectivity and impartiality. This is my personal uh, perspective in science communication that we, then we cannot avoid uh, uh, treating uh, politics inside, inside science. I, know, I don't mean political parties, I mean politics. We are a part of political actor. We are people, citizens, and public intellectual, and we, we have to take the responsibilities for this, in my, in my opinion. Uh, so yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, coming to, to Paula stance, yes, I, I, I don't think that citizen science is a myth. I think it, it can be a trick. It can be cheating. Uh, it can be a facade, a rhetoric to to hit them that decisions are still being taken by the old guys and not the new girls, for example, and new actors and so on. So it can it can be a trick to do not make real participation. But then I think that we we should use this rhetoric to see the project of citizen science only and one of several aspects 
of building uh, scientific citizenship. It's not the only one. We have a lot of other kinds of, of, of things to do. And citizen science is one. And if you do it well, it's not a myth, it's not a trick, can be a real uh, concrete practice of, of citizenship. And I think that in South America, we are in a, in a good position to try to make this utopia, make, make it more a, a utopia than a myth. That's something that we will achieve. Uh, but I think that in Latin America, we are in a position, in a better position to achieve this than, than in Europe. Because for two reasons. The first reason is that society is inside science all the time in Latin America. We don't need to talk about science in society because it's the opposite, it's society into science. So science in Latin America always had to cope, to respond, to answer uh, political stances, economical problems, social needs. And our third mission in South America is not knowledge transfer. Our third mission in South America is extension, is social extension. This is one third of what we do. Harvard do not do this with their money. Cambridge do not do this with their money. Uh, a university in South America must do 30% of the, what they do is social programs, is social extension. So uh, science is this is only a bad new name for something that we learned to do uh, several years ago. Uh, I'll give some examples. So, for example, a colleague of mine has a, uh, uh, a citizen science program with corals, but it's not uh, using people to help him collecting data uh, on corals. He makes people who live with corals because they are touristic guides, they are fishermen, and they together build a way to use corals to generate income and to have tourists and to protect the environment and they build the data together and they make a museum together that is useful both for tourists and for the local people. They are the guides of the museum and they produce the exhibit. So this co-production of knowledge uh, can be effective can be effective. People can protect better the environment, having an uh, advantage from this, and produce scientific good scientific data, not only being explored as, as a low cost uh, workforce. And uh, in some of these cases, we have real uh, decision taking from people, from local people with scientists. For example, in the Amazon, we have a project of protection of, of uh, rare fishes and the participation of the fishermen was crucial to discover novel aspect of this ecology. And so scientists really needed the local knowledge and local knowledge really uh, produced a new politics in the place. So it, it's only some uh, sporadic cases, but they show the possibility, show that the utopia is not only a myth, it's, it's possible to be effective. In Brazil, yeah. we are tradition like uh, participative budgets with people, uh, uh, social groups in every city that, uh, that monitor the political institution. This is a strong tradition in, in Brazil. So our political structure, even being authoritarian, less democratic, uh, 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 have some possibilities that are not so clear in Europe, for example. So I, I quite optimistic about this. And you're right, the problem is not in the people, the problem is in, the, in, in us, in the scientists. We are racist, more than, than a lot of people. <laughs> we are sexist, but the, 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 uh, we have young girls occupying schools in Brazil and saying things that are becoming public policy. So we, we have now very novel public policy uh, for transgender scientists, for indigenous uh, intellectuals that are very novel and that they came from this very strong interaction between civil society and the academics. So this is one example more than scientific literacy do not bring you to better attitudes because you can be a doctor, a, a, professor, a university professor and being a racist. So knowledge does not bring to good attitude. Absolutely, and I would just, you know, that would be my point. I know that, that there are other questions, just to comment very briefly on that. That, of course, depends on whom you defy as the people. So I would say, if you don't go, I am from Buenos Aires. If you go to Buenos Aires, to the rather wealthy of middle upper classes, the people will not be ecological, transgender, sensible, uh, etc. They will be full of racist, 
yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the people as well. That was my point. I mean, it's not as that easy. I'm sure you know much better than I do. So I remain still somewhat skeptical, but it would be really great to deepen this debate. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, I'm just more optimist than you, but we agree. <laughs> I believe that, uh, so did you finish, right, uh, Yuri? Can I, yeah, okay. I, I believe that Viola wants to raise something. Yeah, just one reaction to a uh, jury. I would be, um, I would hesitate to, to say that scholars should define themselves as political. Um, of course, they are citizens, but in that public role, I think I would always recommend to um, to show people that, that you act in the role of a scholar, because there are, we had, as we said, there are um, different many differences in the logic. And for instance, if you do research on climate change, and if you, um, if you go on and on and on um, showing one political um, uh, direction, as, as you said, with regard to chorus or whatever, um, you won't be credible after a time. If you make new studies, people won't believe you anymore. I think it's really important to keep up this, um, this role with um, implying um, um, uh, scientific methods and, um, and being clear in, in what is research result and, and differentiating from that, what is your political opinion? We really had many examples now within the COVID discussion in Germany that, that uh, one or two of the virologists really got into trouble because they seem to be really near to, um, to the government. And um, in practice, it really becomes complicated if, if, if you are paid in, uh, by government, for instance, or if you uh, really, it, it, um, because government, the logic says that government has to decide and they have their own time logic. They want to be quick, for instance, at the, so especially at the moment. So we had, we had a study that was, um, that was published already before it was peer reviewed and this gave, gave a huge discussion in, in Germany. So I would always recommend um, be clear what you are and what you're not. There are too many, the, the, um, the role of politicians is different. They have to, to make decisions. This, this, is, this is controversial, you know, and this is tricky, but I, I agree. Uh, I suggest for the people who ask it this, a, a very good book discussing this, this tricky issue uh, is by Roger Pilke, a political science, who, who wrote a book which is called The Honest broker and they defend this idea that scientists should be as a polit as a public actor an honest broker of science to war politician uh, but I actually disagree because I mean politics in the original sense as, a, as the, the look for public good so if you are a public intellectual you must discuss the public good and so in some cases, you, you have a political position, not a, not a, a party position, not a pro-government or anti-government, not a leftist or right position. It's not in this sense political, but you must say the truth to power. And so you must take into account the power. So for example, when our government says that you can use hydroxychloroquine to solve COVID-19, scientists have the duty to say that the government is wrong and this is political uh, unhappily it's not our fault but uh, there is no other way when government says that in my university we stolen 15 million dollars we stole 15 million dollars and that we are planting uh, marijuana and synthesizing drugs and official members of our government told this we have to enter into the fight and there is no other chance. So it's, I, I understand, the, uh, it's a very difficult question, very complicated, but... Uh, so, uh, Paula, do you want to add something? Uh... I was just thinking that I totally agree with what Jury says, but also at the same time with what Viola says. And I think somehow that depends, of course, as Jury already said, you know, how, on how we define and how politics is defined. And I think, again, as you perfectly said, this is a tricky issue. And I would very much agree that, yes, science, academia is always already part of the political in many ways. I mean, not to talk about all the structural exclusions that are, you know, based on systems of dominance, on racism, on neocolonialism, on sexism. So that, you know, it's, it's, it, we are always part of politics. But then that, again, is at the same time too vague, too general, too 
oversimplified. So it really depends, as we have already seen, you know, what exactly does it mean to be political? And as I put it in a comment here in the chat, I think one political move is to resist being politicized in a specific way. Um, not to, you know, let us be cornered by exactly the examples Jury already gave. And I have a lot of experience with that, not at the same, you know, kind of repressive and relevant level as your maybe experiences in other places, also colleagues in Hungary or in Poland or in the US or in Brazil. But even in Germany, you know, we are constantly attacked as being a waste of tax monies, of being pedophiles, of perverting youth, of stealing money, et cetera, et cetera, by not being qualified enough, not doing good research, et cetera. So the question is, how do I react? And I think, again, I would agree with Viola in that sense that a political reaction is the one to defend our own academic, scientific, research-based, as you said, truths and logics, and to say, I'm not going to let our, myself, my institution be politicized in that way without being naive and saying politics, I have nothing to do with that, which is also obviously wrong. But it you know, depends very much, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really difficult to navigate, but it's important to do so, um, to again, insist on you know, being clear about what, what do we mean by politics, by values, by et cetera. That's why I insist so much on this complexity issue and finding a way of being easily accessible about this complexity issue. So um, somehow I agree with both, but it shows, you know, how, as Jury correctly said, how tricky this is, yeah. Uh, we have plenty of questions. We don't have that much time. So maybe we can have now around about COVID, the COVID context and what it means for science communication. So there are a couple of questions here in my hands. Uh, so the first one, uh, is uh, what do you uh, guys think about the, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. Yeah, with the pandemic, uh, we have been living a, a, a very uh, particular, very specific moment, uh, uh, which is uh, to follow the science and cons construction research studies about treatments, drugs, and now the race uh, uh, to, to, to getting the, the vaccine. Uh, debates uh, uh, about articles with different positions about treatments and uh, political follow-ups and lockdowns. Uh, so in your view, uh, what this specific moment can help uh, uh, a better perception uh, of uh, science, a wider perception of science? And then the second question is, uh, uh, the COVID-19 open uh, ways for the infodemic. Uh, in, in this way, study, preliminary studies, uh, as soon as uh, they have uh, this, uh, 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 its conclusion, their conclusions in headlines, uh, such as, um, um, so I will interpret the question, not trying to translate, but basically what the person is asking about is the fact that some preliminary studies are actually presented as uh, 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 consolidate uh, results, uh, not as a, a science in con construction. So I, I suggest that the three of you, if you want, comment about the, the present context of the pandemic and what it means for science communication. So do you want to start, Viola? Yes, I can do, of course, only with regard to Germany, and it will be interesting to hear from Brazil uh, what is the situation there like. I would say all in all, and most of the communicators are agree, I think, in that, um, that um, it has widened the perception of science, actually of natural science very much. Um, many people heard for the first time only the word of peer-reviewed um, uh, magazines, for instance, um, they realized how it works in um, um, uh, what is science, and um, that's probably the, maybe the the one who quest asked this question referred to this this case in Germany. As I said, there had been one um, study um, published very early, um, and um, there we had this problem of different logics. Media logic was very quick and. Uh, was not very differentiated. So um, although the, the professor might have um, said the right thing, it, it didn't in the first um, reports in the media, it, 
it didn't get clear that uh, it was um, a non peer reviewed um, uh, paper, for instance. So um, on the whole, I think it, it, um, it, it's a good thing for, <laughs> um, for the academic world that, that, um, that society, many groups in society have understood, understood more. Um, also, what are methods of, of, um, of, of research, for instance, and um, procedures as well. Paula, do you want to comment about the COVID context? In yeah, I'm not sure I understood all the questions, but yeah, as uh, as a kind of comment, as I said in my uh, first input, um, I think that globally and especially in Germany, but in Western Europe, um, I I think we are all many of us were rather surprised and positively so that yes, while what Viola said is absolutely true, was mainly um, medical, biological, et cetera, you know, mint science, uh, STEM science, sorry, um, that was communicated, there was and still is a lot of visibility for social sciences. I believe that to be true. From what I gather, I read a lot of Argentinian, especially media and Chilean, but also in the US and uh, in West, Western Europe, um, Scandinavia, social sciences have been really surprisingly visible and present. And I would very much agree that's what we know from the data in Germany with jury, the same in Germany that people have surprisingly maybe even, you know, you could be surprised from what public discourse uh, has um, about the rather really overwhelming still trust in science by you know the kind of general society and public in social as in other science so there is a still high, very high levels of trust and goodwill towards science um, so that's kind of a general impression which i think is quite positive and something we really can build on um, what i then more specifically thought that you know a kind of against what Jury really interestingly, and I really very much agree, said in his presentation that there tends to be, we, we all, I personally as well, tend to be rather reductionist about our own disciplines. You know, sociology knows best, biology knows best, et cetera. Philosophy always knows best, of course, et cetera. So um, against that, what I think the great chance, and we saw a little of that um, with the COVID crisis, is that there is a great um, chance here to show, again, the complexity and interconnectedness and the vulnerability of all things living and being. The pandemic kind of the situation and much of coverage brought that, that there is a shared vulnerability you know that we are vulnerable to a virus that the virus is vulnerable to other circumstances that there is a kind of you know this concept of vulnerability of the living of the biological of the biosocial is a great chance one for science communication but the other way around for us to understand in within science how political these issues are because vulnerability of course is very inequally distributed as again jury and many others pointed out so i think this is really you know the issue the concept the topic of vulnerability in a very concrete biological sense up to the very maybe abstract ethical sense is really a huge chance for us to generate also and tr mutually translate our findings the political policy ethical issues um, towards each other and we could somehow, I think, connect around this concept of vulnerability. And that has happened quite a lot in the German media. So the concept of, you know, um, being vulnerable and how to deal with that and how I try to also show how to learn from Latin America in this sense. I think Germany has a lot to learn from also how social movements work uh, in, in Latin America. So I think there's a, a great chance there for a lot of the topics we are talking about right now. Thank you, Paula. Uh, so Yuri, the floor is yours. You are in mute. You are in mute. 
<laughs> I agree totally with Viola and Paula. So I, I just add an, another another perspective uh, because the one part of the question was also about uh, in the pandemic specific context of uncertainties of science or, of controversies and i think this also was an opportunity actually it's a danger and opportunity on the one side uh, i was a journalist for several years and i know that we science journalists has a pro I have a problem in communicating uncertainty of science, it has a problem with coping with social controversies and socio-technical controversies. But uh, in the pandemics, it was impossible to avoid this because the things were changing very quickly inside the scientific consensus. So it was in the public sphere directly preprint hypothesis changes of policies from from who was always in the public sphere so people on the one side had a very big problem in what can i trust if uh, actually things are moving so fast but on the other side we as science communicators and scientists had a huge opportunity to show to people science in action uh, how really we function and why science is solid is not solid because it, is the, it has the good answer and the definitive answer. We, science is good because it's a, it's a way to make good questions and to have adequate answer and solid knowledge to help solve the new questions. So science is good because it's a menu of several different possible futures and not because it's the only one eternal universal dogma. This is not science. So it's a very good opportunity to show science in action and to appreciate the value of uncertainty and, and, uh, and risk and probability and to show this to people. So what I would say to science communicators or scientists who want to communicate is do not obey only the W of communication. Do not say what, when, where, and who but begin with the how, how science do this. Do not say science make this, science discovered this. Do not say only the what, say the how, because if you say the how, you can really bring people into science because they can really understand, appreciate that what is important is our process. This makes science a solid knowledge, a robust knowledge a trustable institution, not the individual claims of one white coat scientist saying, uh, this is what I discovered. This is what uh, science may, made for you. Uh, this is not the best way, in my opinion, in this situation of uncertainty to communicate science, but to, to embrace uncertainty and make it a, a strong part of our communication. I think that preprints and pandemics give us the chance to see this so uh probably it is the last round of questions there are two questions uh talking about science communication in a broader way one is a question uh, raised by carlos palma who has a, a very beautiful company uh, on science and theater uh, and so he's asking about uh, how art can contribute to to science communication in a, in a different way. So if you uh, can comment about that. And also there is another question about informal education, uh, specifically about uh, science centers. And uh, so how you, you see the, the role of science centers in, in hands-on science center in science communication and uh, specifically for Yuri, the Brazilian context. So do you think that the science centers are uh, doing, um, are, are enough uh, because the person believes that they are still in the, in, they are not uh, in numbers, they are not enough for this br big Brazil. So maybe Yuri can comment specifically about the Brazilian case, but I think that for Viola and Paula, it will be interesting to, 
to refer about the German context and maybe for Paula also the the Argentinian context because one thing that caught my attention is that Argentina is so strong in terms of uh, culture in terms of book for example and uh, is one of the countries in Latin America that they have a kind of less uh, science center so maybe Paula can comment something about that too, if Paula feels comfortable. So anyway, uh, Viola, do you want to start? Then Paula and Yuri, it will be actually your last comment. So if you want to wrap up something as your last comment, it will be welcome too. So Viola, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, maybe la one last comment to the COVID situation. For me, it was interesting to observe that suddenly both journalists and politicians were again in a situation of learning and listening. That was really uh, interesting because we had this, we have months of perplexity now every day and every month we've got new challenges. And um, then it was the situation that they came back to uh, who knows something we don't know. <laughs> and this is an observation that during all those years before um, often didn't happen because uh, politicians are forced by media into the role of being, um, um, what is it, I listened, um, knowing everything. Um, and uh, this is different now. Um, so um, I really um, enjoy that because we have, for instance, talk shows on Podia that are much more um, reflective now um, than, than before. But that was just one last comment. Uh, well, um, science and arts or humanities and arts, um, of course, this can be a very fruitful um, combination, I think. Um, there again, of course, we have to do with different um, different uh, logics. Um, so our experience, for instance, is it's easier to to bring together, for instance, authors, um, people writing themselves, uh, bringing up literature, together with people from the humanities and social sciences, because they share the common ground. Their common ground is language and text. So um, although artists think in a totally different way and their approaches are different, it's still, there is a bridge and they can come together and in our case, talk on religion or, or other um, on ethical questions and so on. And I think in a, also in an irritating way, it is very fruitful. Um, we have had the cases that, that artists, um, people, um, uh, con uh, constructors or, or uh, painters, for instance, wanted to get into contact, and that was much more difficult because their field is um, there is a wide range of ambiguity in, in arts there, and um, I think it they even wouldn't uh, define always define as a true um, a topic, for instance. So um, there was some shyness on the side of the scholars, maybe. So. Um, that, and we found out we would have, we, we stopped that at that point, but if I think it's a question again of um, finding the right format to get into dialogue, for instance, but um, there are some uh, growing amount of formats in Germany, also between natural sciences and arts. And one point with regard to the science centers, I think there are research results on research communication saying that the barrier of those science centers are pretty high, that people, um, if you really want to um, reach the wider public, whatever that might be, <laughs> um, you, you would still usually um, reach with science centers as well as, as um, exhibitions in museums, you still mostly reach people that at least that are um, educated academically and in some way. So if you really want to um, to get into contact with others, you, you'd find, had to find other uh, other spaces and formats, I think. Thank you. Viola, <laughs> Paula, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I must say, I really cannot speak to the Argentinian situation in that sense. I wish my mom was here. I would ask her. She's a chemist and knows much more about the Argentine situation than I do. So I really, I mean, institutionally, in order to answer such a question, I can really not um, answer to that. The role of art, I think is again, super interesting, but again, I would maybe stereotypically answer, again, art is a culture in its own right and logic. I think art is really um, not 
as some might think, and I'm sure the, the person who asked the question wouldn't think that, but many in academia uh, or some want to think of art as, you know, kind of um, multiplier or easy way to spread the word or so. But I think art shouldn't, again, be, you know, used uh, or subjected to a kind of logic with, which is not inherent to arts. And I think, again, as it is all our political duty somehow to insist on the in semi-independence kind of logic of our field, art should do the same. So um, I think art is super interesting and important to generate new perceptions of reality, to irritate our way of seeing things, to set impulses, to, to just, you know, change our perception, question our perceptions, think about how we perceive the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that is a super important impulse for academic uh, endeavors, for politics, et cetera. But you cannot simply expect art to communicate science or so. That would be, again, a wrong, I think, approach. But to include, to, 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 to bring in um, art in the process of mutually translating and talking to each other from these different logics, I think is super important. And we have had in some conferences, I have co-organized um, always some or very often elements of arts, uh, you know, be it theater, be it uh, installations, performances, um, dance, um, as an element of a conference, but really strictly as an element, not trying to, you know, kind of colonize um, these art, artistic elements as to make us understand something academically, but really to open up a space for debate, for reflection, for reflexivity, for a different kind of experience, um, for moving, etc. cetera. Um, so yes, I think that's very important and it should be part of the conversation, as I said, you know, thinking of, again, also the differences um, of these different areas. Thank you, Paula. Yuri, the floor is, is yours. Yeah, uh, Paula and Viola uh, said everything already, so just, just completing. Uh, science and art, yes, I agree perfectly with Paula. Uh, I, and Carlos, you made the question, but you are better to answer than us. So you know much more than us to, uh, about this. But yes, it's crucial, it's fantastic, uh, is being done, not enough, but uh, art uh, is a form of knowledge production. Uh, hearts has is its own language. So a lot of scientists, when thinking to collaborate with artists, thinks arts only as the, the golden pill, the sugar pill to make science into the, 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 the head of people. This is not art. The, the worst possible relation between science and art is to thinking art to make it nice, the scientific message. So I, I know a lot of scientists that go to the artists and say, well, I want to explain genome editing. Please make it nice, artistically nice. This is not art. <laughs> this is design eventually. I don't know, <laughs> experience design. So uh, arts must be hard. And so I, I'm beginning a lot of, of, of uh, collaboration with artists and I go there I sit there and I see them producing knowledge and perceptions. And I only say, how can I help you to make your artistic vision uh, possible? W why do you need my help? And not vice versa. I don't think that the artist is my, is my, is my tool. Uh, so I think this is very important to, to remember because uh, art Art is, uh, is not made to explain science better. It's, it's a different things, much more powerful than this. And we should think this. And yes, we need more museum, but Viola said very well that is, this is not the only problem. In Brazil, obviously we need much more investment in science center and science museum. Obviously they are very few to the, to the sides compared to the sides of the country. And obviously we are losing museum actually. So it's a, it's a strange question because Yes, we need to increase museum, but actually in this situation with this government, we are losing museum. 
We lost the national tragedy was the, the we lost the National Museum in Rio de Janeiro. We are losing Science Museum in Sao Paulo State. Uh, we are losing investment. This our government, unfortunately, is explicitly against science, against university, against school. Uh, and it's explicit. They say this. The Minister of Education says that he is against professor. He is against university. So it's not surprising that we are losing the science museum and opportunities, not only economical crisis. We, are, we have a big problem of attack to democracy from very powerful people. So yes, and uh, as, like Viola says, we need uh, another way to make people uh, have a part of their life in this cultural diffusion institution. The, the main problem in Brazil is not only few museums, is that museums are not for several parts of, of our population. In, in Belo Horizonte, people do not go to museum because people from the peripheric area do not go to the center of the city. They cannot go. The ticket of bus, it's so expensive for a family of four people that they will never go there. And if they have the money to go to the center, they go to a shopping center. So uh, no, it's not only the lack of museum, but Viola said it very, very well. And so to finish the, the last message, you said that we can give a last message. Uh, I, I would like to address this message to my colleague journalist. I am a journalist and my colleague academics because of now I own some academics. Uh, do not see please Brazilians as your enemy. Do not fall in the disinformation bubble in which you think that the all Brazilians are a bunch of, of, uh, uh, of crazy people hating science as a social movement to destroy us. This is not true. All the experiment, all the data, all the feedback we have show that this is not true. Please do not say that university are not doing nothing. University are doing a lot of incredible things. A lot of incredible things are happening. So please do not say your public as an enemy. They are your ally and do not see the university uh, with a strange vision uh, in which university do not make no social extension. This is not truth. This is not truth. Uh, if you are a scientist in your lab, maybe you don't have time to see this or to make this, but uh, thousands of, of students and, and professor in university and teacher in the school are making a lot of good science communication now in Brazil. Please see this. So thank you so much, Viola. Thank you so much, Paula. Thank you so much, Yuri. We are finishing shortly in time. <laughs> so I hope that this uh, session actually uh, push for much more discussion about science communication. So. Bye-bye. Have a nice rest of the week for all of you. Bye-bye.